Beth Shapiro. I am the director of the UCSC Paleogenomics Lab and professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at UC Santa Cruz. Can you tell us about your early life and how you came to be interested in science? I was born in, in Pennsylvania, in, um, uh, in Allentown, Pennsylvania. I lived there until I was well, about 11 or 12 when my family moved south to Georgia. And I ended up growing up and going to high school in a little town in northwest Georgia called Rome. Um, I went to the University of Georgia as an undergrad where I studied geology and ecology. But I started off in broadcast journalism. I was convinced that I was going to be a broadcast journalist when I grew up. Um, but, you know, things change. I have some opportunities after my freshman year at the University of Georgia to go on a really amazing trip. I took a class in the honors program that was um, geology and anthropology. And we spent nine weeks camping, sleeping in national parks and learning about the sort of evolutionary, ecological, geological history of the entire country. And I thought, wow, um, I think maybe what I want to do is be a science journalist. And since I already have professional experience in journalism, maybe I'll get a degree in science. So I switched, started studying science, Ended up doing an internship at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Lived there for about 15 months in 1996, 1997. Just fell in love with doing science and ended up following that career trajectory instead. Who were some of your early scientific mentors? When I was an undergraduate, I knew that I wanted to get involved in science, but I wasn't sure what kind of science I wanted to get involved with. And I started off working in the lab of Jan Westphaling, and she was doing sort of cellular molecular biology kind of stuff. And I went in and I read some of these papers and they were about different types of blots and they were about C. elegans or something like that. And I was like, this is not it. Like, this is definitely not it for me. And I went into her office and I said, I don't think this is going to work out. I don't want to be in this lab. And she clearly thought that I was a complete idiot. I broke down because I was embarrassed because I didn't want to do this. And I actually started to cry in the middle of that interview with her um, and felt real dumb. Um, ended up joining uh, the lab of someone in the ecology department, John Pickering. And he uh, showed me how we might be able to integrate um, ecological thinking with phylogenetics. Like learning about how um, ecological changes shape the diversity, biodiversity of species on the on the planet. And, and I think that sort of thinking really focused my scientific energy early in my career. But that experience that I had with Jan also helped shape me as a person. I felt um, like I'd given something up, like I had potentially made a mistake and had to learn at an early age that you're always going to be offered several different paths, right? And you really have to follow the path that interests you, that intrigues you the most. But you shouldn't be embarrassed or ashamed of making a decision. And this is hard, I think, for a lot of overachieving kids. You know, you get all of these opportunities and you feel like, I have to do everything. And if I say no to something, then I've made a mistake. I've done something bad. And everybody's going to be mad or ashamed. She wasn't mad. She was a little bit like thinking that I was kind of a dummy for bursting into tears, but you know, she and I are actually good friends now and we've talked about this initial interaction and she was like, I just knew you were young and naive and trying to make a decision and didn't know how to do this and didn't know how to stand up for yourself. And I think, or stand up for, I just knew that you were young and naive and didn't really know how to capture what it is that you were interested in and say that in a way that felt good to you and that you felt you wanted the other person to hear. And that is also part of growing up. It's part of learning how to be an adult and stand up for yourself. And I think as a scientist, you kind of have to do that a lot. You can't be an expert in everything. You are going to develop some niche specialty. Maybe it's a broad niche, but it's still a niche specialty relative to all the different science that's out there, right? And so you have to be willing in some instances to say, I'm not the expert to answer that question. I don't know the answer to this. That's a really good question. Let's find somebody who can answer it for you. And model that to your trainees. Model, they come to you and ask you a question and you don't know the answer. Don't make something up. Say, you know, this is something I don't know. We'll have to find other people to fill out your mentorship group or your, your committee that's going to work with you. And I think it was a hard thing for me to learn. When did you first hear about the Human Genome Project and what does it mean to you? That's a hard question. I have no idea when I first heard about the Human Genome Project. I 
have never really worked on human DNA other than that I've been tangentially involved with projects that are thinking about it later in my career. I've always been focused on animals. I think I think I probably heard about the Human Genome Project after it was published. I mean, a after the, the very first Human Genome was published. Of course, now embedded at UC Santa Cruz, it's part of our DNA. It's part of how we, we sort of present ourselves to the rest of the world, like understanding David Hausler's involvement and, and Hiram and Jim Kent and all the people who were like deeply involved with really in that race in the beginning to make this happen and seeing how it motivates people to, to look at the biggest, hardest questions in science and say, you know, if we bring a bunch of people together who want to get this done, we can do it. I think that's what the Human Genome Project means to me. It's an absolutely hard thing. And at the time when it was motivated, nobody thought it was gonna be possible. But this motivated so much technology, so much new compute, so many different ways of thinking about how we can integrate all of these ideas to bring them together. I think the Human Genome Project is at its core foundational to all of the genomic work that's going on today. What are some foundational questions that guide your scientific research? I think for me personally, I'm always chasing what's on the verge of being possible, that most people are saying, yeah, I'm not really sure that you're going to be able to do that. I work in a field called ancient DNA, where we go out and we get samples that have been degrading, decaying for sometimes hundreds of thousands of years. And we say, I can get a genome from that, probably. Maybe if I develop some new technology, you know, and so we do. So we go out there and we refine experimental techniques to be able to recover damaged and short fragments of DNA. We come up with computational approaches to take those really tiny, crappy fragments of DNA that are full of damaged bases and map them accurately to a reference genome, even to do de novo assembly of things. Now all that's easy. We figured out how to get DNA from stuff that is really horribly preserved. Now the question is, how do we understand what that DNA actually means? How do we look at these mammoth genomes and elephant genomes and line them up next to each other on a computer and ask, here are the tens of millions of places where they're different from each other. Why is that interesting? Why is that important? What are the actual phenotypic differences between a mammoth and an elephant? And how do we translate these genotypic differences to what actually matters from an ecological or evolutionary perspective? That's what I'm running after right now. And it's hard, maybe even impossible, right? But that is the, these are the questions that I would like to answer right now. Post-Human Genome Project, what are some technological developments that have enabled you to pursue your research? In ancient DNA, this is an easy question. Ancient DNA as a field is driven by technical innovation. Um, was not possible to amplify DNA until after PCR. So in ancient DNA, we couldn't target specific fragments of the genome until after PCR was developed. And then we had PCR and that was great, but PCR requires long fragments of DNA, 20 base pairs for one primer, 20 base pairs for another primer, and then some stretch of DNA in between that we're actually sequencing from the ancient organ. Mechanism. What we now know, though, is that most fragments that are preserved in the bones of an animal that died 10,000 years ago are way shorter than 60 base pairs, probably somewhere in the order of less than 50, less than 40 base pairs. Now, some of these we have to throw out because we can't map them uniquely to anywhere in the genome. But from about 25, maybe closer to 30 and up, we figure that we can pretty much figure out where they go in the genome, but how do we get them? And for that, we needed next generation sequencing. Without next generation sequencing, second generation sequencing, whatever it's called now, um, we never would have gotten anywhere with ancient DNA. It is that technological innovation, the early days, 454, Selexa, all of these things that were allowing you to sequence tiny little short fragments. This is what made ancient DNA as a field possible. Without this innovation, we would not have Neanderthal genomes, we wouldn't have mammoth genomes, we wouldn't have dodo genomes, we would have some mitochondrial DNA fragments, which is great, we learned a lot with mitochondrial DNA, but we needed that innovation to make it there. 
There are also wet lab based innovations. We needed approaches that don't lose the DNA. I think one of the most lossy things in genomics right now, which nobody who works in modern DNA cares about, is when we take the extracted DNA and we transform it into a library that can be sequenced on whatever sort of technology you want to sequence your DNA, you lose most of that extracted DNA. If I have one dodo that is surviving in all of the entire world that has any DNA in it, when when I wash that DNA down the drain because I've lost it, it is gone forever. This is a finite resource. So we need experimental approaches that don't lose DNA, that actually can transform every single one of those extracted molecules into something that's sequenceable. Otherwise, that information is gone. So these are also important innovations specifically to ancient DNA. You know, they have application outside of ancient DNA too. One of the things that we've been working on as a team at the UCSC Paleogenomics Lab, in particular with Ed Green, is transforming some of this that we do to forensic applications. So anything that we develop that allows us to get tiny little trace bits of DNA out of a bone that's 20,000 years old or a piece of shed mammoth hair that we find on a mummy has immediate application to working with shed hairs at cold case crime scenes or working on touch DNA. So anything that's going to be degraded or traced or tiny, these approaches developed for ancient DNA have immediate application in forensics. What are some of the challenges of reconstructing genomes of extinct species? I mean, one of the things that we do as ancient DNA scientists is we try to um, recover DNA from these fossils so that we can create these snapshots of history. And I don't mean like human history, I mean really deep history. We can go back hundreds of thousands of years and get DNA directly from plants and animals that lived at that time period. And we can reconstruct this picture of what the distribution and diversity of biodiversity looked like in the past. And if we can do that over time, then we can start to ask questions like, how did past periods of rapid climate change or rapid habitat perturbation affect the diversity of species that are around us or the distribution of species that are around us? And, and hopefully we can then use that to ask questions about ecology. So what makes some ecosystems or communities more resilient in the face of habitat perturbation than others? And can we use that historical happening, this thing that happened in the past, the rapid warming event after the last ice age, for example, to make more informed decisions about how to protect and preserve species in the present day. And this is something I think ancient DNA has to offer. From a human perspective, obviously, um, we tend to think about everything, including our own species, just with the picture of the present day. Everything always has been as it is right now. But genomics, especially DNA that we can get from the fossil record, tells us that this is not true. We know that species come and go, that habitats shift, and with it, available food and available resources and things move around. We know from all of the human DNA work that's been done in ancient DNA, that people have not been distributed as they are right now forever. People are always moving and fighting and taking over and interbreeding and combining our DNA and creating all of the diversity that we see around us today. And we've learned a lot of this by looking at DNA. I think, you know, genomic technologies have made it possible for us to sequence whole genomes and recently these telomere to telomere genomes, T to T genomes from lots of different species. And we have computational advances that have allowed us to line them up next to each other on a computer. And that is great and it's interesting and we can use this because we kind of understand the clock rate by which changes accumulate in genomes to estimate the evolutionary time scale of life and start to ask questions about what sort of external events might have driven some of these changes that we see, radiations of different lineages or particular adaptations that come about. But I think the biggest challenge that we're facing as a community right now is how do we translate these long strings of A's and C's and G's and T's into genuine understanding of how that makes species look and act the way that they do? What is it about genomes that make us look and act the way that we do? This is something that we don't know. This is something that I think we're in the 
very early stages of trying to understand. And these technological advances and decreases in sequencing costs that have allowed us to generate these ge genomes, this is exciting. This is the resource that we need to start asking these questions, but now we actually have to ask them. And to do that, we have to figure out how to ask them. Where in the genome do we look? I mean, we've started with the obvious. We look in the genes, but that's a tiny part of the genome. And that can't be what's driving all of these enormous changes that we see in the diversity of life around us. So what is it? And how do we look? Um, fortunately, we do have uh, lots of new technologies that are helping us to be able to look at cellular phenotypes. We can do gene editing experiments where we can take something and we can make specific changes, and then we can ask in those cells or in that edited organism whether it's different in some way. And can we correlate those differences with changes in gene expression or changes in the gene sequence that we've created? And, and that is how we're going to start testing how do we link genotype to phenotype. And I think this, this is the, the great, the great unknown at the moment. This is the moonshot. How do we, how do we correlate the DNA sequence with the way we look and act? Can you tell us about other exciting work being done in the field of ancient DNA? I talked a bit about ancient DNA. There's lots of different people that are doing different things. Uh, I think one of the coolest things that we learned about in ancient DNA recently is that DNA can be preserved extracellularly. So we know that we can take a mammoth bone and we can grind it up and we get mammoth DNA. We also get microbial DNA, fungi and bacteria and everything that sort of entered that bone while it was buried. And so it's a logical step to think, well, what if I just go into the environment and take some dirt and sequence that? Surely that will have DNA in it too. And we've learned that yes, if we can control for finding sediments, dirts, soils that have, that we know how old they are, that it hasn't mixed up too much over time, that we can use that and get a snapshot of the entire ecological community, the entire, sorry, we can use that and get a snapshot of the entire biological community that's present at that time interval. So we can go to an old lake where you get the deposits that form on an annual way. You can take a core of the bottom of that lake and you can extract DNA from along that core from the oldest to the youngest, and you can ask questions about how that community has changed over maybe tens of thousands of years. Recently, Eska Villerslev, who is an ancient DNA scientist in Denmark, published a paper that had ancient environmental DNA that possibly dates to the Pliocene. This is the oldest DNA that's ever been recovered, if it really is that old. And he's got some evidence that it probably is. And it shows a community in northern Greenland that is a warm, adapted community, which to me suggests that this is something that predates the Ice Ages. Otherwise, why would there be a warm, adapted community that far north toward the pole? So this is an incredibly exciting innovation in ancient DNA. Um, the work that Ed Green is doing to translate genomic advances in ancient DNA into forensics, I think, is going to be enormously important. You know, right now, whole genome data is not admissible as a type of evidence in forensic cases. But that doesn't make any sense to those of us working in the field of genomics, because we know that genomes are great for identifying people, for letting people go that are, that are you know, falsely accused of committing a crime and for convicting the right person. So that is, I think, something that the field is going to see really pushed, advanced over the next couple of years. Um, David Reich's work in, in humans is, is incredibly impressive. I mean, he has systematically gone through archaeological collections from around the world and used a particular way of sequencing what he calls ancestry informative markers. So he's not trying to sequence whole genomes. Instead, he's looking at particular SNPs, which makes it easier in ancient DNA. You don't have to have great preserved DNA. You can just pull out of your mixture of DNA very specific SNPs that tell you about ancestry. And he's using that to reconstruct the human diaspora out of Africa and across the world and ask questions about how many waves of movement are there? How much admixture between different groups of people has there been? How has these, how have these early evolutionary movements shaped the diversity of people that we have the pleasure to interact with around the world today? What was it like winning a MacArthur Fellowship? When I got a phone call that I had won the MacArthur Fellowship, I think I was in just kind of disbelief. Why me? Why, why would, why do I deserve a MacArthur? <laughs> it's a bit strange. It's an honor, obviously. I mean, I feel 
it 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 validates that kind of the struggles that we go through are are worth it. I you know when I first moved back to the U.S. from the U.K., I spent a lot of time writing proposals to the National Science Foundation. I work on animals, so it was NSF that money that I was going for, and I was terrible at it. Um, the first eleven proposals that I submitted were rejected, were not funded, and I was ready to throw in the towel. Um, and after that, I did get one grant from the NSF, and then I got the MacArthur. And it was, it was, it was almost like, wait, come back. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you don't have to give up. <laughs> um, you can do this. Uh, other people believe in you, which is, which is really cool. Um, they have, I think the MacArthur, they do, um, they have ways of trying to figure out how to tell you. For me, what they did was, um, I was, extremely pregnant. I think I was like maybe eight months pregnant. So I was very pregnant at the time. And um, I wasn't coming into work every day. And there was this undergrad who kept asking for an in-person meeting. And this is this was early, this was pre-Zoom. Otherwise, this would have been really easy. But it was like, I really want to meet you in your office and have a conversation about things. And I'm like, I'm really pregnant. And, and it's a really long walk uphill for me to get in. And can you just wait? And, and she was adamant, just absolutely, I really need to talk to you. And so I agreed that I would come into the office. And it was winter. And it was gross outside. And I walked into the office. And I'm feeling angry. And she didn't even turn up. And I'm sitting there at my desk, waiting for this woman to come here and thinking about sending her a really mean email. And I'm actually starting to compose this really mean email when I see a phone number on my office phone, because that was still a thing at the time, that said John D. Catherine T. MacArthur. I'm like, mm. so I answered the phone <laughs> and they were like, this is so-and-so and we want you to know that you've been selected for a, and I was like, really? <laughs> like, this is, <laughs> really? <laughs> And I remember having that conversation and hanging up and then they called me back to confirm because they said, you probably don't believe me, but I'm just calling to confirm. And, and, and then I looked at this mean email that I was composing to this student and I went back and I was like changing it to be maybe we can meet again. Then they called me back again and they said, oh, and by the way, that student doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> They had done that to get me into my office so that they could call me and tell me that I was chosen for MacArthur. How do you approach science communication in a way that is effective and avoids misappropriation? Um, I think science communication is easy if you, as a scientist, think to yourself, I am communicating to a normal person, right? I think scientists have a tendency to try to throw data at people. And when you first start to talk to somebody, when you're first interacting with people, whether it's an audience of other scientists or an audience of interested members of the general public, if you start with data, you lose them immediately. Our The first thing that we do when we interact with somebody is we decide whether we hate them or not. Like it goes back to our crocodilian brain, right? This idea is, am I going to have to run away because this is scary or am I interested and excited about this and then I'm gonna start paying attention. If you start with data or if you um, caveat every sentence, then it becomes run away. I, I can't do this. It's gonna take too much of my brain power and too much energy. I Even if I understand it, I'm not interested. So I think the most effective way to communicate science is to imagine telling a story the way you would want to hear it. And don't worry about the nuances. You obviously have to present the nuance somewhere, but do that in your manuscript. Or if somebody has a specific question later, talk to them about the nuances. Scientists get so carried away with potentially being wrong and worrying that what they're saying is going to be misappropriated that they end up not being clear and effective communicators. And we just have to be willing to take risks. Risks. If I talk to people about bringing extinct species back to life, they are going to be intrigued and some of them are going to be angry and people are going to have questions. If I start by talking about how hard it is, how complex it is, how some of these specific details mean we're never going to get there, I'm going to lose them. Of course, I'm going to get there in the end. It's important to talk about what we can't do, what we're really talking about when we say, I'm thinking about bringing extinct species back to life, which is not actually bringing extinct species back to life, but you have to hook them at some point, right? As far as misappropriation, I mean, we live at a time where people are going to take what you say and turn it into something else if they want to. And I don't think it matters how you say it. I don't think it matters when you say it. I think if you are clear and you are 
also clear about what you don't know, then that is the best that you can do. And you have to be willing to do it as a scientist without fear that somebody's going to twist your words because somebody is going to twist your words. The problem comes when you start to care. <laughs> And I don't mean like you shouldn't care that somebody's twisting your words. I think you just shouldn't worry about it from the outset, right? Somebody's going to take what you say and deliberately use it to say something else. We've published work about bears, about brown bears and polar bears hybridizing that have been used by people talking about how evolution can't be true. And as a scientist, I just think that's silly right? But if I were afraid to publish my results because I thought some crazy group of people who want to say evolution isn't true are going to use that to support their crazy arguments, that would make me a bad scientist, right? Um, I don't care what a crazy group of people say to the people that they are speaking to. What I care about is that I can communicate my science in a way that is actually of interest to the people who are willing to be interested. Can you tell us about some of the early challenges in the field of ancient DNA? Very early in the days of ancient DNA, just after um, PCR was first developed, there was a race to try to get the oldest and coolest bit of DNA, including a bunch of labs that were publishing DNA from things like dinosaurs and, and plants that were hundreds of millions of years old. Turns out those were all contamination, right? Um, and it took the field some years to figure out how to reel ourselves back into the world of reality. After we came up with strategies for authenticating the DNA that we'd recovered, um, we really have been transitioning into a real scientific field rather than Jurassic Park kind of scientific field. Can you tell us about your work on de-extinction? So with, with any species um, that are candidates for de-extinction, there are a different set of technical challenges that one would need to overcome to bring that species back to life. There are obviously ecological questions that would need to be answered. And then, of course, there's ethics. Um, technology, um, if someone is a de-extinction purist and they want something that is 100% identical in every way, genetically, behaviorally, physiologically, to a species that's extinct, that is never going to happen. We cannot recreate something that is gone because we are more than the sequence of our A's, C's, G's, and T's that make up our DNA. We're a combination of that and the environment in which we live. And those environments are, when we're talking about things that have been extinct for a long time, gone. So even if we could make all of those genetic changes, which we can't right now, even if we could do that, we still wouldn't end up with something that is identical to a species that's gone. So when we talk about de-extinction or resurrecting extinct species, what we actually mean is we're going to take a species that is alive today and we are going to tweak its genetic code in a little bit of ways so that we can make it look or act more like this extinct species. And to me, this is what I think is most compelling about de-extinction as an idea. It's not bringing an extinct species back to life, which is kind of a silly idea. Instead, it's developing technologies that we can use to modify species that are alive today with the purpose of helping them to adapt in their habitats. The pace of ecological change, of habitat change today is faster than what it's possible for natural selection to keep up with. And we, as people, have already been manipulating the evolutionary trajectories of every species that we encounter in this world, right? If we want to successfully preserve biodiversity, and I think we want to be thinking about a future that is both biodiverse and filled with people, then we have to be willing to capitalize on these new tools that we've developed. And by that, I do mean cloning and genome editing and even moving DNA between species in order to create phenotypes that, that we think are, we hope, are adaptive in a particular habitat. I don't think this is straightforward, and I don't think everything is appropriate for this. But imagine there is the black-footed ferret project right now, right? So there are these black-footed ferrets that are genetically depauperate, that are living across the American plains, and there is a captive breeding program that is doing very well at making more black-footed ferrets. But black-footed ferrets are facing a problem that is caused by a disease, plague that we introduced as we humans expanded across the continent um, during the European colonial period, right? So black-footed ferrets are in trouble because of a disease that we introduced. Domestic ferrets, which are the evolutionary cousin of black-footed ferrets, are immune to plague. They evolved alongside plague and they don't get it. 
So if we could figure out what it is about the genomes of domestic ferrets that makes them immune to plague, could we then transfer that bit of adaptation from domestic ferrets into black-footed ferrets, creating a slightly genetically modified black-footed ferret that is now capable of surviving in its habitat of today. This is where I think these sorts of tools, the same tools that we would need to bring a mammoth back to life or create an Arctic adapted elephant, depending on how you're willing to define it, could be used to take living species that are in danger of becoming extinct and help them not have that happen. Can you talk about some of the current major challenges in your field? In the next month, moving on from my academic role to take a role as the chief scientist at Colossal, which is a company that was created um, a couple of years ago to bring a mammoth back to life. No, actually, they're developing all sorts of technologies that are relevant for biodiversity conservation. And I'm hopeful that in this role, I'm going to be able to um, really help them motivate the development of technologies that are going to be the most useful for biodiversity conservation and really push them in this direction. Um, I think, though, that the hardest thing that we're going to face is not any more sequencing genomes of extinct things or aligning reference genomes against each other, but instead figuring out what it is that we need to tweak. How do we know what gene or genes or regions of the genome are responsible for a phenotype that we want to be able to control? We don't know. We need new approaches to be able to test phenotypes in cellular culture, in whole animals. We need those to be automated. We need things to be safe and ethical. We need to interact with people who are thinking about what happens when we have these species. We need to think about interacting with policymakers and people who work for the agencies to say, if we do have a genetically modified black-footed ferret, can we release? it? How do we release it? How do we monitor these individuals? How do we effectively control this? Do community members even want this? We have to make sure that as we're developing tools to save species, that the people who are going to be most impacted by whatever we do, and this is everybody who lives on the land, and especially indigenous people whose land it is, are consulted and, col and they're key collaborators in this process from the beginning. And I think we're in a good position to do that because none of it is possible right now. So it's not like we're bringing people in at the end. We're saying, let's create a community of people who we want to bring together to drive these technologies forward, to decide to what extent we want to drive these technologies forward, and then to make decisions about the best ways to do this that are ethically and ecologically sound. And then at the same time, let's develop these technologies because we don't have any more time. We are in a crisis. We are in a crisis of extinction. We are in a crisis of arable land. We need to be able to figure out how we are going to push ourselves toward a future Earth that is both biodiverse and filled with people, and we need to not reject technologies just because we're scared of them. What are some areas of opportunity in your field in the coming years? Hurdles are opportunities, right? I think, I mean, the Human Genome Project is, a, is an absolute example of this. Um, hurdles are opportunities. The hurdle of actually figuring out how to sequence the human genome was an incredible opportunity for scientific innovation, for innovations in collaboration, and continues to be. I mean, this institute that we're sitting in, the NHGRI, is an institute that was formed because of this crazy idea. And it persists, even though we already have a human genome, now because there is so much more to do. There's so much more to learn. And every day, it seems like there's some new innovation in the way that we can manipulate cells or modify cells or read phenotypes or grow organoids so that we can actually create phenotypes in organoids where we think these genes are going to be useful. We are at the beginning of understanding the human genome or any other genome that's around us. And as someone who doesn't work on people, I will say that we are not going to learn everything we want to learn about people unless we also study things that aren't people. We need to know what's going on in the genomes of other things and not just primates. <laughs> we need to know what's going on in the genomes of all of the biodiversity of life if we actually genuinely want to understand what it is that makes me as one person different from other people, what makes us different from other primates, and what makes primates different from other eukaryotes. This is the beginning. In your career as a scientist, what are some of the things that have surprised you the most? I think for one thing, I'm surprised that I'm still working in ancient DNA. I tried for a long time to not work in ancient DNA anymore because it's highly competitive and there are some people in the field that have quite large egos. 
When I was a postdoc, I was working on RNA virus um, evolution, using some of the same computational tools that we use for ancient DNA. And I thought that that is the direction that I would go in and ended up just kept getting pulled back into working in DNA. Then I spent all of my time in ancient DNA talking about how de-extinction was stupid and impossible. And then I wrote a book about de-extinction to say that it is really hard and probably impossible. And now I'm going to basically run a de-extinction company. So that's pretty surprising. I, I mean, I guess I'm also surprised about my success. You know, I think everybody is. I didn't go into science imagining that I was going to end up being able to publish lots of papers in really high profile journals and be asked to come speak at the NIH and do all sorts of cool things. But here I am. And really, all I've done the whole time is just follow what I'm genuinely interested in. Try not to be a jerk right? Have lots of collaborations and be open to taking risks and following new ideas, even if they might seem kind of crazy and even bad ideas. What advice do you have for trainees or those interested in studying life sciences? Um, I would not be where I am today if I hadn't been willing to take risks. Um, I did not. I wanted to be a broadcast journalist when I was an undergraduate. I had no idea that I would end up as a scientist. And this happened because I took a class that I didn't know if I would like but sounded cool. And then I went to work at the Smithsonian, which I was kind of nervous about doing. And then when I went to do my PhD, I had no idea I was going to end up in ancient DNA. In fact, I had applied to a different program that I didn't get into because I didn't get the fellowship that I wanted. I ended up as a Rhodes Scholar, wandering around the halls of Oxford, trying to figure out what I was going to do with the next three years of my life when I met Alan Cooper, who said, I don't have any students and I need somebody to go to Siberia. And I was like, well, that sounds as good of a reason to pick an ancient, uh, well, that sounds like as good of a reason to pick a topic for a PhD thesis as anything else. I've always wanted to go to Siberia. That was a mistake, but you know. <laughs> um, but if I hadn't taken that risk, if I hadn't been just willing and open to do something new, this was a brand new field at the time, 1999. Nobody was doing it. But what I saw in it was that it combined all the stuff that I was interested in, which was ecology, deep history, learning about DNA, and storytelling. And storytelling to me has been a really integral part of my scientific journey, my scientific career. Um, I started off in broadcast journalism, ended up as a scientist, but I've written two popular science books. Um, I am always looking for opportunities to communicate science. As a National Geographic explorer, I've done tours around the country talking about de-extinction and ancient DNA to audiences of normal people. And, and I think this is important. You know, we are facing all sorts of crises in our future. We have a biodiversity and extinction crisis. We have a crisis of disappearing amounts of arable land. And we need to be willing to take risks with the technologies that we have if we're going to solve these problems, if we're going to move toward a future that is biodiverse and a planet filled with people. And the only way that you can get people on your side is if they can understand you, right? It is very hard to accept crazy sounding biotechnology if nobody has sat down and actually told you what it is and what it isn't. And I think with genetic modification, that this is a main problem. We have a very small number of very loud voices that have told a lot of people to be scared. And that's not helpful. We need to be able to um, use we need the time to be able to evaluate the riskiness of these technologies. We have been manipulating the evolutionary trajectories of all the species around us for as long as we have existed as a lineage, as humans. This new technology allows us to do that with higher precision. That's all, right? I mean, we have made products like ruby red grapefruits and green and wheat by taking plants and zapping them with radioactivity or chemical mutagens, ways of creating lots of different mutations in those genomes. And those things, when you buy them at the grocery store, have a little green non-genetically modified sticker on them, right? But the people who are opposed to genetic modification say that they're opposed to it because they don't like this idea of mutations that might have some impact. That just says to me that people don't really understand. These green stickers are giving people 
false choices. This is not the way that we need to be communicating to people. Yeah. Ruby red grapefruits are not dangerous just because they were created by mutation breeding. We eat loads of things that have mutations that we don't understand. In the same way that an organism that has had a single very specific gene tweaked to make it not turn brown is not dangerous to eat. All we need to do is be able to communicate these things to people in a way that, that allows them to understand what's happening so that they can buy in. This is an incredible opportunity it's an incredible challenge, but it's something that we have to do. And I would say to trainees and young people who are thinking of going into science and biodiversity, think about also learning how to be an effective communicator. Think about ways to tell your story to people that helps them to understand what the power of our technologies is and also what it isn't, because we have a lot at risk and we have to be able to give people the knowledge that they need to buy in. Not everybody is gonna be an effective communicator. Not everybody's great at it. Some people don't like standing up in front of audiences, and that is fine too, right? You can write things that aren't in front of an audience. You can work with your peers who are extroverts who like to stand up in front of an audience and give them feedback. There are ways that even if you don't like standing up on stage, you can help figure out how to get this message across. And I think this is increasingly important today. As a scientist, you have to be not afraid that somebody's gonna twist your words because they are. Right. There are bad actors out there and they're going to do that. So get over that. And then you have to think, how am I going to most clearly communicate what I'm doing that limits the amount of people that are going to take this and twist it, but that more importantly, brings more people in, asks more people to engage with what you're doing, makes more people feel more comfortable talking to you as a scientist and respecting scientists and science. Can you tell us about the origins and the goals of the company Colossal? So Colossal was formed about two years ago now um, with an investment from a lot of people in the entertainment industry and some other investors with the excitement of potentially bringing mammoths back to life. Um, I have been engaged with Colossal as a consultant, as they call me their lead paleogeneticist on their website for the last two years. And in that, my role has really been to help bring in people from the ancient DNA community to advise them on how to make sense of the ancient DNA data that they're collecting, but really to try to push them toward um, positioning themselves in a way that makes it easier to understand really what they're doing. Um, they're not creating a mammoth, they're creating an Arctic adapted elephant. But here is another one of those communication issues, right? If I say to you know, a four-year-old out there, we're making an Arctic adapted elephant, are they gonna understand me? But if I say we're making a mammoth, they might, right? And four-year-old's a bad example, but it might also be true for my mom right? Um, the Arctic adapted elephant? What is that? And how would you do that? Mammoth? Oh, I've seen one of those. That's like an elephant, but you know, it's got long hair and, and thicker fat. Yeah, that's an Arctic adapted elephant. So, you know, words matter and audience matters. And I'm going to encourage scientists to think about that a little bit as they accuse Colossal of saying things that they, they shouldn't be saying. I've also encouraged them to be more proactive, thinking about the ecological implications and sort of regulatory pathways of what's happening if they were to create genetically modified animals that they want to release in a habitat. And, you know, they're very thoughtful about this. They've been traveling around and speaking with different indigenous groups in Alaska and in Canada and um, you know, really talking about what people want and what people don't want way before, I mean, decades before there would actually be an animal that was out there, which I think is exactly the way that this should be done. Um, also working to set up ways to test hypotheses about genotype phenotype interactions. This is this is hard, hard to do. Um, I think you know Col Ben Lamb, who's the CEO of Colossal, has said that any technology that they develop for de-extinction will be made available for free for the purposes of biodiversity conservation. And I intend to hold him to that. Um, I think this is a really important step uh, in biodiversity conservation. In fact, I always get the question. Colossal have raised around $250 million. And people will say, this is terrible. Shouldn't that $250 million have gone to conservation? My answer is yes. 
we should raise $250 million for biodiversity conservation. But that $250 million was never going to go toward traditional approaches to conservation. This is new money that is being invested in developing new tools for biodiversity, and we should welcome that. We need new tools. We need new approaches. We need a toolbox that is increasingly big because we are facing an extinction crisis. And I am grateful for Colossal's you know, headline-grabbing approach to bringing in new money that can be applied and will be applied to protecting and preserving species that are in danger of becoming extinct. I think this is exactly what we need. Um, for this reason, I have made the fraught decision, and I have been hand-wringing about this for a year and a half, that I will be going on leave from my academic position to take a role as the chief scientist at Colossal beginning in the middle of March 2024. And that is daunting. I never thought that I would end up in a position in industry, but I also see this as a potential to have um, a bigger impact on um, legislation, on regulatory pathways, on the way that we can move forward with biotechnology for conservation than I could in my academic position. Am I scared? Absolutely. Petrified. Um, maybe this is the worst decision that I've ever made in my life. Um, I am um, nervous about the people in my lab, but I have made a lot of effort to making sure that they are going to be completely supported. I'm not actually leaving. I'm still going to be there, but they're all going to have co-mentors. I've brought together money so they're supported and they can do all the things that they needed to do. Um, I've even got Colossal to hire some of them that are in later stages who are also excited about, about moving in this direction. It's, it's, Colossal is really a research organization, but back backed by industry money. And, you know, it's hard to raise funds for conservation. So why not capitalize on this opportunity? I think Colossal are poised to do some incredible things to push forward biotechnology and conservation. And I am hopeful that I can help steer them in that direction as I take on this crazy leadership role.